time we're going to have a, a fascinating presentation. It's an educational session that is sponsored by an educational grant from ja Jazz Pharmaceuticals and Daiichi Sankyo. The title of that presentation is Inc Incorporating Novel Treatment Approaches into Clinical Pathways in AML. And this is presented by Dr. Amir Fati. Dr. Fati is the Director of the Leukemia Program at Mass General and the Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical. Thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, these are my disclosures. The learning objectives are provided here. Um, I'm going to be uh, speaking relatively broadly about uh, the challenges regarding AML, both from a clinical, social, economic perspective, but mainly about the emerging treatments that are changing the landscape of our therapeutic paradigms um, and looking at the potential opportunities and challenges uh, that arise as a result. Okay, so I'd like to, since I like history and I uh, uh, like the sort of the emergence of our knowledge regarding uh, cancer in general, I thought I'd provide at least one slide on a uh, brief history of uh, acute leukemia. So. Um, it wasn't very subtle back then in the mid-19th century when leukemia was first described uh, by, independently by John Hughes Bennett and Virchow, um, who saw uh, in autopsy, mainly autopsy reports, patients with very large spleens, uh, low blood counts, and suppuration, which is actually a release of white um, uh, blood. Um, and uh, they, uh, Virchow uh, created this term called Weissblut, which means white blood, sort of very high levels of white blood cell count circulating, which we don't see anymore because we try and treat these patients. But if you let leukemia get out of hand, ultimately you do get Weissblut. Um, uh, in 1868, Ernst Newman first suggested that the origin of blood cells, cells that circulate in the blood, um, is the bone marrow. And we started to learn more about how leukemias emerge. And ultimately, it took about a century to learn exactly the, uh, some of the genesis questions regarding AML and better classify, initially at least with molecular flow cytometric techniques and then with <clears throat> also with immunohistochemical approaches as well. The current uh, picture of AML, um, at least according to uh, the most recent data, is about 20,000 cases per year. So compared to our more common cases of malignancy, such as colon cancer and breast cancer, it's about a log less, which is a good thing. AML is not a good malignancy to have. Um, uh, a large proportion of patients also die from the disease because some are refractory to treatment. Many relapse from initial treatment after initial response. Um, and the median age is about 68 and probably uh, goes up every year as our population ages. So when I started uh, as faculty, it was 66, and that was about a decade ago, and now it's 68. So, and as we age, it's only going to go up, which does present its own challenges. So the traditional prognostication of AML, and this is actually a slide that was provided to me when I was a fellow about 12 years ago. And so... Uh, this has changed in many ways, but the traditional prognostication was to look at the patient, which is obviously very important, look at their comorbidities, because if they are older or uh, less robust or have multiple other organ uh, comorbidities, they may not be able to tolerate the intensive, intensive treatment that's been there for them for uh, decades, literally. So that immediately limits what you can do in terms of getting patients into remission. So the patient themselves uh, is extremely important in picking therapies and ultimately the prognosis. Did the disease evolve out of a preceding marrow malignancy? So acute myeloid leukemia can come in large to two large classifications, secondary and de novo, and there's uh, larger iterations there. But suffice it to say that de novo AML is disease that emerges out of a a previously normal-looking uh, marrow, and secondary AML arises from a prior marrow malignancy uh, that is maybe more indolent. And that more indolent marrow malignancy, it may be genetically unstable, and over time, as the disease progresses, it may progress from a myelodysplastic syndrome, from a chronic myeloid leukemia, from a myeloproliferative neoplasm of a variety of different types into a AML, which is then called secondary. Secondary AMLs, because they arise from an already um, you know, uh, sick soil um, are harder to treat. Uh, 
And then we also looked at certain molecular markers. Um, so we looked at the chromosomes within, this, within the malignant cells. That's by cytogenetic analysis or by fish analysis. And we had a few mutations that we could go on uh, that would tell us whether this is perhaps a, a disease with better or worse prognosis, such as FLT3 or NPM1. But over time, things have gotten much more complicated and complex, especially over the course of the last five to eight years. We have now have a series of mutations that have emerged describing the underpinnings of AML. Um, these include IDH1, IDH2, DNMT3A, TET enzyme alterations, ASXL1, you name it. There's a whole host of splicing alterations that have been discovered, all of which are very important because they tell us a lot about the genesis of AML but they also potentially provide us avenues for targeted treatment. If a mutation leads to an overactive enzyme that causes the disease to emerge or progress, we may be able to inhibit that enzyme with a small molecule and then have a therapeutic impact. So before we get to that, though, and sort of the, the major themes of our talk, let's talk about this traditional induction chemotherapy. So, um, this emerged based on these early papers, as you can see, very old papers because they kind of look old there, but in the late 60s and 70s. Um, and the, the, the sort of the, the hallmark of treatment, the bedrock of treatment, uh, were two chemotherapeutic agent classes. One was cytarabine, and the other were a group of drugs called anthracycline, so either donorubicin or idorubicin over time. And the combination of cytarabine and idorubicin ultimately in various forms became the basis of induction chemotherapy for AML, the most common of which was the 7 plus 3 regimen, where patients would come into the hospital, get seven days of continuous infusion, meaning through IV they would get cytarabine infusion continuously day and night for seven days. And the first three of those seven days, they would also get either idorubicin or donorubicin. And there were other iterations, such as IA, which is not continuous infusion, and active EP16, which we used to give at Hopkins. But suffice it to say, many of these induction regimens did the same thing, which was what I call control-alt-delete. You know, so when my dad calls me and says my computer doesn't work all the way from Florida, the first thing I tell him to do is press Control-Alt-Delete. And if I'm lucky, the screen will come back working. If I'm not lucky, uh, it will be an error message. And what induction regimens in many, in similar ways do is they empty out the marrow completely, reboot the system, and you hope that by 30 days later, after you've started treatment, the marrow recovers, but with normal stuff. And that's called a complete remission. And about 70, 75% of the time, we get a CR or a CRI, which is not quite a CR, but close. So that is not a very elegant or smart way to treat, but it works in terms of getting an initial response. So that's what induction stands for. So induction is trying to induce a remission. In fact, it's short for remission induction. Remission is not cure, so you have to go to the next step of treatment, which is consolidation. So consolidation, whereas the goal of induction was to get a remission, the goal of consolidation is to cure a patient. And what is cure in AML? Three to five years of remission. How do you get a patient there? Well, you have choices. Either you can give more intensive chemotherapy, such as with high doses of cytarabine, again, a relatively old paradigm, or for patients with higher risk disease, such as those who have secondary AML or have higher molecular risk features, you can transplant them as consolidation. And you try and cure these patients. And we're lucky about 30, 35% of the time in curing patients. The other proportion of patients, unfortunately, don't respond to initial treatment or relapse after remission. So these are curves relatively recent, relatively recent, about three years old, that show survival curves according to age and AML. As you can see, uh, patients who are younger do much better because probably they have less aggressive disease, and they probably can tolerate intensive treatments. Patients who are older, specifically over 75, do much worse, probably because they have, they're more likely to have secondary disease, and they're also less likely to be candidates for intensive treatment. If a disease comes back, your outcomes are even much worse. These curves are pretty sad. This is actually a more recent, actually not as recent, I'm sorry, analysis of patients who received re-induction chemotherapy for relapsed AML based on age, and regardless, folks don't do as well. So let's talk about some of the treatments that have emerged. As I mentioned, a series of mutations have uh, been discovered in the last five to seven years that help characterize AML, but potentially also provide us um, opportunities for targeting um, uh, 
therapies. So <clears throat> in 2009, uh, a group out of uh, Wash U first described IDH1 mutations in AML. IDH1 mutations were previously discovered in glial malignancies, gliomas, and a subset of uh, glioblastomas. Uh, they were associated with normal cytogenetics, um, normal chromosomes and malignant cells, as well as concurrent NPM1 mutations. Um, and a subsequent group, uh, also a, a separate group subsequently also discovered IDH2 mutations, which IDH1 resides in the, uh, in the cell uh, cytoplasm, IDH2 resides in the mitochondria, and IDH2 mutations were also discovered in AML as well. Um, this is, uh, I don't know how well it projects, not that great, but uh, so uh, IDH stands for um, uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase. Now, I had, prior to 2009, 2010, I had promptly forgotten what that was, but it's one of the enzymes in the Krebs cycle, which I had also promptly forgotten. I've learned, learned, a, learned, a, learned a Krebs cycle probably about 20 times in my life, kind of like uh, biostatistics. I uh, apologize to any statisticians here, but, uh, uh, but it's one of those things that goes in and out. But uh, the IDH enzyme uh, is very key to the Krebs cycle. It provides uh, um, uh, reduction of NADH and leads to release of ATP and energy for the cell and mitochondria, so it has crucial effects. But the alteration of the mutation, actually, the actual mutation, leads to an altered isocitrate uh, dehydrogenase. The altered IDH protein, instead of going from <coughs> isocitrate to alpha-ketoglutarate, it actually catalyzes a separate reaction, converts alpha-ketoglutarate backwards to a metabolite called 2-hydroxyglutarate, 2-HG. 2-HG is an oncometabolite. The way it works is it suppresses a key enzyme called TET, which is important in the methylation of key genes that differentiate blood cells in the marrow. And in fact, suppression of TET leads to suppression of differentiation of cells in the marrow because it inhibits key enzymes that do that, methyl, methylation. Hypermethylation phenotype is, leads to suppression of genes that help mature cells. So if you suppress TET, you actually end up causing an immature phenotype to emerge and aspects and features of AML. And 2-HG suppresses TET and works in this fashion, or at least it's thought to do that. So what people thought was that if you're able to inhibit the altered IDH1 or IDH2 enzymes, you could decrease the levels of 2-HD, suppress the suppression of TET, allow the cells to again become hypomethylated, wake up the genes that were previously shut down. The cell says, oh, I have to mature normally now. The leukemic blasts become more mature cells, and as a result, you potentially get a therapeutic response. Now, a separate question is if you have an IDH mutation or not, does it have a prognostic impact? There has been a whole host of retrospective studies that have been done across the population of cooperative groups and European studies, and in general, they have shown very inconclusive or conflicting results. We looked at our population of patients here at the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center, which includes the MGH and the DFCI, and at least prospectively looking, we did not see a major difference whether they had IDH1 or IDH2 mutations, although the population was relatively limited. There have been a whole host of companies that have looked at developing a variety of IDH inhibitors. Uh, Enacidinib and Ivocidinib were initially developed by Agios, and uh, Enacidinib, I believe, is now uh, mainly owned and uh, worked on by Celgene. Uh, they're both now approved for use in patients with IDH2 and IDH1 mutated AML, respectively. There are other IDH1 inhibitors also currently in development. So let's talk about the IDH2 inhibitor, enacidinib. Again, this is a, a, a small molecule that inhibits the altered IDH2 enzyme. The initial phase one dose escalation and dose expansion and all, all the, the, over time phase two study of the drug uh, looked at multiple cohorts of patients, and one of the major cohorts were patients who had relapsed and refractory uh, acute myeloid leukemia. So these are patients who had prior treatment, and we know we looking at the curves previously, how poorly those patients in general do. All these patients had IDH2 mutations, and this study was relatively broad, looking for safety and tolerability and a variety of dose ranges uh, that were looked at in multiple uh, patient populations. In addition to relapsed and refractory AML, they also looked at some older patients in the untreated setting as well. Ultimately, a dose of 100 milligrams daily was chosen as the dose to expand and look at further in phase two studies. In these trials, uh, the predominant 
interesting toxicities that emerged were hyperbilirubinemia, which was largely benign and indirect, meaning it didn't lead to significant sequela, but was something that was seen, especially in patients who had Gilbert's. Um, but more importantly was differentiation syndrome. So when cells, when sort of aberrant myeloid precursors in leukemia don't differentiate, it's bad. But when they differentiate too quickly, causing a cytokine-mediated storm or a differentiation syndrome, that's not too good either. So a differentiation syndrome occurred in about 10 to 15 percent of patients who were treated with anacidinib, which is a marker of actual therapeutic effect but can also be quite lethal, and we'll touch base on that as well. There were other less uh, prominent toxicities that was seen, including mild cytopenias, um, and, but overall the drug was well tolerated. What's remarkable is that the overall response rate across patients, whether they were relapse or refractory or newly diagnosed, was appro approximately 40%. And that was overall response, not CR alone. If you counted CR or less robust CR parameters, such as CRI or CRP, um, the rate of uh, composite remission was around 20%, which nevertheless in this population is quite uh, important. The time to response was longer. So as I mentioned with, mentioned with induction chemotherapy, you give seven and three, you wait 30 days, you see if you have a remission or not. With this, sometimes it takes two months, three months, sometimes it takes six months. So you have to potentially wait, and you have to monitor patients and assess them for potential toxicity. This bar graph provides you with some degree of information regarding the uh, response assessment over time. On the bottom, you see the cycles, which are approximately 28 days, and how long it took before patients achieved their best response. The red uh, portion of those bars is uh, CR. So as you can see, it often takes around six, six cycles before you see your best response with this treatment. This is the median overall survival for these patients, which was nine months, which is quite remarkable, I think, for this population. But even more remarkable are those patients who had remission versus those who did not. As you can see, um, the median overall survival for the population of patients who achieved the CR was about 20 months. And those patients who received responses that were not quite CR, but nevertheless responses, were about uh, 14 months. So that is by itself quite remarkable. Just to sort of hammer home, point, hammer home the point about differentiation, you could actually follow differentiation looking at marrow biopsies in patients. On the left panel, you see a typical marrow of a leukemic patient with monomorphic myeloid, myeloid blasts uh, in the marrow. <clears throat> and over time, you see the emergence of more mature myelo myeloid cells. And finally, by the beginning of cycle three, you see a CR, which shows a sort of a normal, different, uh, sort of a normal diaspora of different alteration, uh, different cells in various stages of maturation. To, again, mention sort of how this potentially is differentiation, they're looking at a blast that has a, I believe this patient had a trisomy um, 8 uh, alteration, if I'm not mistaken. I have to go look back. But there's three abnormal chromosomes in that uh, blast. This was followed through over time. And in the mature um, granulocyte, those still were there, suggesting that the aberrant uh, malignant cell matured with the aberrant chromosome intact in it, whereas the lymphocyte had the normal uh, two chromosomes. Differentiation syndrome. So this is a uh, patient who was treated with anacidinib uh, starting uh, obviously with cycle one, um, had a sort of a classic uh, response over a period of the first two cycles with a steady increase in blood white blood cell count, normal white blood cells. As you can see, the top panel with that curve going up steadily, the orange line. The marrow is that middle panel there with the granulocytes expanding and the blasts being that red portion decreasing. This is the typical differentiation phenomenon you see with these IDH inhibitors in patients who do respond. And around the beginning of cycle two, you see this gray area, those gray vertical bars, which are the episodes of differentiation syndrome, which can manifest relatively nonspecifically. So unexplained fevers, pleural effusions, pericardial effusions, unexplained pulmonary infiltrates, azotemia, meaning elevated elevations in creatinine, rash. And since so many things in patients who have AML can cause these things, you have to sometimes rule out secondary causes. But if the, if the symptoms are progressing, and certainly if there's no evidence of a secondary cause, these patients should be treated with steroids. And we oftentimes monitor patients initially, try and rule out secondary causes. But if we can't, and it looks like differentiation syndrome, and if they are differentiating in the blood, 
or if their symptoms are progressing rapidly, we do give dexamethasone twice a day at 10 milligrams. And as they get better, which they should, if it's differentiation syndrome, we taper that down. Concurrent with differentiation syndrome, your white count can actually precipitously rise, and we can have patients with white counts of 50, 100, and so they may also need hydroxyurea to control uh, their disease or their manifestations during this critical time. So that's anacidinib. Let's talk about ivocidinib. Uh, so this is also the uh, made uh, initially created by the Agios Pharmaceuticals. Um, it's an IDH1 inhibitor. Uh, this was a similarly designed study, again, looking at multiple cohorts of patients with relapsed refractory AML, but also a subset who had untreated AML, uh, looking at this drug, and ultimately a dose of 500 milligrams once daily was chosen to expand and look at further. <clears throat> the toxicities are provided here. As opposed to enacidinib, where a, a toxicity of note was bilirubinemia, the toxicity of note here um, was QTC prolongation. So a subset of these patients had elevations in QTC, um, although uh, grade three um, abnormalities were fewer in number. But this was something certainly to look at. Again, there were a proportion of patients who had IDH differentiation syndrome. The proportion listed here were grade three or higher. Um, the remission rate uh, is also provided here. This is a combination of CR and CRH, which was a sort of a new endpoint looked at in this study, CR, as opposed to complete remission, which is a marrow of less than 5% leukemia cells and a, a neutrophil count of 1,000 and a platelet count of 100,000. That's the benchmark. That's a good-looking situation after induction. CRH was a slightly lower benchmark of 50,000 platelets and 500 neutrophils, around the point where patients are... Uh, in a better situation and can be managed on the outpatient side relatively safely. So the proportion of patients that actually achieved CR or CRH um, was around 30%. So that's actually quite remarkable. Um, also for this drug, which in terms of response rate was relatively similar to anacidinib. But perhaps also important, or even in some situations more important, was the degree of transfusion independence that emerged in these patients. So if you're a leukemia doctor, and, and uh, I happen to be one, one of the challenges is uh, uh, in terms of impact and quality of life in our patients is the fact that they have to come to the hospital twice a week uh, to get platelet transfusions or red cell transfusions. Um, the fact that they're always at risk of potential cardiopulmonary uh, sequela or bleeding and these drugs seem to markedly decrease transfusion dependence over time. Even patients who did not have a classic response to treatment, a minority of them developed transfusion independence. So although they didn't achieve the classic response criteria, they had improvements in their transfusion needs. The overall survival curve is very similar to what we saw in anacidinib. Uh, in terms of uh, survival in patients who were responding. And in fact, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, in patients who had a CR or CRH, the median overall survival could not be approximated given that those patients continue to live. And as a subset of these patients, they actually found that the mutation cleared. And in fact, in those patients who had a clearance of IDH1 mutations, had a better overall survival. So anacidinib and ivocidinib are certainly not the only IDH inhibitors. Uh, there is a, a series of, that are also currently under study, specifically IDH1 inhibitors. FD2102 is a, another trial currently under study. And uh, we only have preliminary results to show, but multiple different cohorts are under study, including monotherapy studies and uh, monotherapy cohorts, and also combination, meaning combining the IDH inhibitor with traditional treatments. These are some of the responses that were recently presented at uh, uh, national meetings, again, showing an overall response rate of approximately 30 to 40 percent, which approximates what we've seen uh, with other IDH inhibitors. So let's move on to FLT3 uh, mutations. So FLT3 mutations are a bit older in terms of us knowing about them. They're probably all, all mutations have been there since the time of dinosaurs, I suspect. But uh, uh, they, they, uh, they're more um, intriguing in the sense that uh, they're, in my view at least, that they're activating enzyme alterations. So a uh, FLT3 enzyme is a receptor tyrosine kinase. There's a whole host of them in uh, cancer, as you know, EGFR, VEGF. Um, 
But uh, so the, the typical feature of a receptor tyrosine kinase is an extracellular domain, a cell membrane domain, and then a sort of intracellular kinase domain. And the alterations that typically impact the FLIT3 receptor, which resides on hematopoietic precursors, myeloid precursors, are uh, two types of mutations that impact sort of the intracellular leaflet there. So the ITD mutation and the TKD mutation. The ITD mutation stands for internal tandem duplication alteration. The TKD stands for tyrosine kinase domain point mutations. The ITD alterations are more common. Both of these alterations ultimately lead to a not ligand independent receptor tyrosine kinase, but a less dependent receptor tyrosine kinase on the ligand. So generally speaking, the ligand binds this receptor, it dimerizes, activates, tells the cell to divide. But when you have these alterations, it doesn't really need the ligand as much to tell it to do that. It just is on all the time. So the myeloid precursors and the hematopoietic precursors just divide and proliferate. And in fact, the classical feature of a FLIT3 ITD patient is a monocytic AML with a very high white count, very proliferative. So it, the, the actual mutation drives much of the disease, although it is a late mutation in uh, most patients. So let's talk about some of the drugs that have been looked at. There are first generation and later generation FLIT3 inhibitors that have emerged. Most of the first generation FLIT3 inhibitors are just dirty, nonspecific receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. They were actually developed to inhibit other enzymes for other malignancies, but they also happen to inhibit FLIT3 one of which was mitostorin. Mitostorin was looked at monotherapy studies um, uh, as well as some combination studies in phase one and phase two studies. And ultimately, cooperative group and uh, large panels looked at combining it in a large phase three study called Ratify, where they would combine mitostorin, FLIT3 inhibitor, with seven and three chemotherapy in patients who were FLIT3 mutant and younger than 60 and compare it to 7 and 3 plus placebo and see if there was an advantage. And after many years of looking at these patients, looking at 7 and 3 plus mitostorin versus 7 and 3 plus placebo and then consolidation and then maintenance, they actually found a survival advantage um, which led to a decreased risk of death <clears throat> over time. And this led to the very first FDA approval in the last year or two um, for this FLT3 inhibitor in patients who are induction eligible with a FLT3 mutation. So when a patient comes into our clinic now or comes into our hospital with an AML, we try and rapidly determine if they have a FLT3 mutation. And if they do, they no longer just get 7 and 3. Well, I try and get them on a study. But if they're getting conventional treatment, they get 7 and 3 and a few days later, they start mitostorin as well in combination with 7 and 3. But mitostorin was not the only nonspecific FLIT3 out there, uh, FLIT3 inhibitor out there. Serafinib, which many of you in the audience probably have heard of uh, being approved for use in hepatocellular and renal cell carcinoma, is also a very potent FLIT3 inhibitor, but also relatively nonspecific. This study <clears throat> looked at the combination of a hypomethylating agent, which was a drug that we use for our older patients with. AML in combination with serafinib to see if we get a decent response rate in relapsed refractory patients. Bless you. Um, so in patients who uh, receive this combination, majority of them, again, with relapsed refractory disease, there was a CR-CRI rate approximating about a, in about uh, a third to 40% of patients, which is quite remarkable. I've used this combination myself in our older patients uh, with FLT3 mutated AML who cannot get induction chemotherapy. The median survival was about six months. Again, these are older patients. And it really did matter, did seem to matter whether you actually inhibited the FLIT3 enzyme or not, although it did not reach significance in this group of, a uh, limited group of 37 patients. If you inhibited the FLIT3 enzyme, it looked like you had a slightly uh, improved benefit. Again, did not reach statistical significance. Now, those were sort of the nonspecific early FLIT3 inhibitors. Over time, there have been highly potent, highly selective FLIT3 inhibitors that have emerged. Giltaritinib, Quizartinib, Cronolinib, all of them relatively selective for FLIT3 and very potent. So the initial studies that looked at these drugs looked at them as monotherapy. And so this was a trial that was published, an early phase 1-2 study of gilteritinib, very potent FLIT3 inhibitor, um, in relapsed or refractory AML. 
And by itself, not in combination with chemotherapy, it led to remission rates between 35 and 45 percent, somewhere in that range, which is quite remarkable because mitostorin, lastortinib, serafinib, they don't typically lead to those high rates of response by themselves as monotherapy. So these uh, drugs can be quite potent. And there was a dose effect. So 80 milligrams and higher patients had a much higher likelihood of achieving a CRI or CR. And their survival seemed to be a little bit better at approximately 30 weeks in terms of median overall survival. This was just that, presented um, uh, this year at the European Hematology Association and uh, received a lot of interest. And so pay attention. This might be related to one of the questions here. So the Quantum R trial uh, was a phase three study looking at quizartinib in relapsed refractory patients with a FLT3 mutation and compared it to dealer's choice for relapsed refractory salvage regimens that are otherwise available for AML patients. And they were able to actually get um, to a, a point where they could announce actually a survival advantage in patients who received quizartinib. And in fact, patients who received single-agent quizartinib had a 24% reduction in risk of death compared to patients who receive salvage chemotherapy, which included low-dose ARC and other types of reinduction chemotherapy. The median overall survival was 6.2 months for those receiving quizartinib and 4.7 months for those receiving salvage chemotherapy. Of course, all of this is evolving over time. And the estimated survival probability at 12 months was 27% for those receiving quizartinib and 20% for those receiving salvage. This did achieve significance at this relatively early time point. So the last topic I want to talk about is novel approaches to induction chemotherapy. As I said, for the longest period of time, <clears throat> induction chemotherapy included chemotherapies that were older, less specific, highly toxic, such as cytarabine, idorubicin, and donorubicin separately, um, leading to GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, hair loss. Um, a drug that was recently developed uh, used a liposomal formulation of cytarabine and donorubicin called CPX351. Let me show you a picture of the liposome. It was a 5 to 1 molar ratio of cytarabine to donorubicin. This ratio, at least in preclinical studies, seemed to provide the most of the highest efficacy uh, as opposed to other ratios. And this being a liposomal product was thought to focus the chemotherapies much more potently into the marrow environment and less likely to cause non-hematologic, at least, toxicity. Phase two initial studies and a phase two study were, was quite promising, and a phase three study was looked at in patients with higher risk disease and compared CPX351, the liposomal drug that included both drugs at a five to one molar ratio, to traditional seven and three. And this was specifically in high risk patient population, patients with secondary AML between the ages of 60 and 75. And this is the patient population listed here. As you can see, the median age is approximating what I mentioned earlier, which is around 68. All patients had secondary AML, and many had unfavorable molecular markers. The response rate is provided here. And in this population of poor risk disease, the response rates are poor for both groups, but much better for CPX351. In fact, CR plus CRI, if you combine the two, is around 48% versus a third of patients who got seven and three. And this actually led to a survival advantage over time for CPX351. And this study, again, just to reiterate, is for was for patients between the ages of 60 and 75 with secondary AML. All of this led to FDA approvals. So mention mitostorin for adult patients with newly diagnosed AML and a FLT3 mutation. The anacidinib, IDH2 inhibitor for relapsed refractory patients with IDH2 mutations. The CPX351 liposomal product now is available for patients with therapy-related AML regardless of age because folks thought, I suspect, that the disease biology being what it is should not be limited to age groups. Gemtuzumab I didn't talk about, but it's an antibody drug conjugate which was reapproved for use in AML in various settings, mainly in the relapse refractory setting, but also in combination with um, chemotherapy, <clears throat> predominantly for patients with favorable risk disease. And finally, most recently, ivocidinib, the IDH1 inhibitor, was approved for use in patients 
who have IDH1 mutations and are relapsed and refractory. So just to touch on the NCCN guidelines, the most recently published NCCN guidelines has incorporated both mitostorin plus 7 and 3 um, in uh, patients who are younger uh, than 60, as well as incorporating CPX351 who, uh, for patients who have uh, secondary AML. But as you can see, the category is a 2B recommendation, which does not show a full unanimous support uh, given that the study was done in patients who have are between the ages of 60 and 75. In patients who are older than 60, again, we see the presence of mitostorin plus 7 and 3 because we say that patients who are induction eligible should also get FLT3 inhibitor therapy in combination with induction. And also, you see the incorporation of CPX351 as an option for therapy in these patients as well. And finally, for relapse refractory patients, we now have several options that we're recommending. Um, the combination of hypomethylating therapy with serafinib that I mentioned is not something that has been uh, opined about by the F FDA, but since serafinib is already available and approved for use in other solid tumor malignancies, we have it available and we use it many times in patients who are not induction eligible and combine it with hypomethylating therapy and get fairly good results in terms of disease control. And of course, the IDH2 um, inhibitor anacidinib for patients with relapsed refractory disease and an IDH2 mutations, and respectively, ivocidinib for the same patient population with an IDH1 mutation. So how do I integrate this into my clinical practice and what I generally recommend to community physicians who I'm in communication with regarding management of patients? Well, if an adult patient has a newly diagnosed AML, is induction eligible, has a FLT3 activating mutation, um, I recommend initiating mitostorin at 50 milligrams twice daily from days 8 to 21 of induction chemotherapy in the hopes of achieving remission and helping them uh, potentially have a prolonged remission afterwards. Anacidinib are for patients who have relapsed and refractory IDH2 mutated AML. There are two variants, R140 and R172. Uh, the more canonical IDH2 alterations are other IDH2 mutations that are much less common, we don't know about the efficacy of the drug necessarily in those groups, but in the most common forms, it can be quite efficacious, but it does take time, so responses can occur weeks to months after initiation of therapy, and the typical starting dose is 100 milligrams daily. CPX351 is, in general, for patients with secondary AML. I generally limit treatment to patients who are older with secondary disease, but as I mentioned, uh, there are folks who treat all patients with secondary AML who are induction eligible with CPX351. One thing that I should mention is that although it is true that CPX351 has a more limited toxicity profile than 7 and 3 in terms of non-hematologic toxicity, in terms of hematologic toxicity, patients actually have prolonged cytopenias, probably because of the heightened impact of the drug in the marrow environment. So that is certainly something to consider. Ivocidinib, again, for patients with IDH1 mutations, there is one main canonical alteration called the R132 alteration. The dose is 500 milligrams daily, given continuously in repeated cycles. And again, it can take time to work. For both anacidinib and ivocidinib, my recommendation is that patients be closely monitored in the first few months of treatment uh, for differentiation syndrome, <clears throat> which can manifest nonspecifically um, in terms of uh, fevers and respiratory symptoms and cough and shortness of breath, um, and um, they should be analyzed and evaluated and, if necessarily, promptly treated with steroids to manage their symptoms. If they have secondary causes for those symptoms, they should also be concurrently treated for potential other causes. So future considerations. Now, FLT3 inhibitors are being studied very aggressively in this space. We talked about quizartinib, gilteritinib is also being studied. There are other drugs that are being looked at. I think over the course of the next decade, there's probably going to be many other, I shouldn't say many, but there's several other drugs that may be approved, and our next decade may see more approvals than the last four decades altogether. So it's a very exciting time. One of the challenges that we have is how do you sequence therapies? Let's say you have a patient with a FLT3 mutation let's, and also has an IDH mutation and maybe happens to have a secondary AML. How do you sequence these drugs together? I mean, do you give IDH first? Do you give FLT3 inhibitor first? What do you do? Those are still questions that are left unanswered, but everybody probably has their own pr pattern of practice. There are unique side effect profiles with these drugs. 
FLT3 inhibitors can also cause a differentiation syndrome. FLT3 inhibitors can have potential side effects such as QT prolongation with some and LFT abnormalities with other, skin manifestations with other. I already talked about the unique toxicity, toxicities of IDH inhibitors such as QT prolongation with ivocidinib and bilirubinemia with n in it, but also differentiation syndrome. Survivorship. This is something that's kind of very interesting. We have patients now with targeted therapies, with lines of treatment who live much longer than they previously did. That raises additional challenges uh, that may arise, um, such as infections, immunosuppression, um, other potential secondary malignancies that may arise that we would have not otherwise seen because patients would not have lived that long. So these are questions that come up. Finally, cost. So these drugs that are emerging, they're novel, and they're also fancy, and they're also extremely expensive. So potentially getting uh, coverage for them, making them available in hospitals. Um, uh, the process of getting um, prior approvals, insurance consideration, these types of things are becoming increasingly um, relevant and something that we are working on to learn more. But again, these approvals are, approvals are relatively new, and we're still learning exactly um, how all of this will potentially affect care and management for patients. There are lots of reasons for optimism. There are improved outcomes due to better prognostication, better molecular characterization of AML, better patient selection for different therapies, better supportive care by far, emergence of effective targeted therapies, some of which I've talked about today, novel combinations in older patients. I briefly talked about hypomethylating therapies and serafinib, but there are many other ones that are interesting and are being looked at, such as hypomethylating therapies and the BCL2 inhibitor venetoclax, which also is a very promising drug that might become available for AML patients shortly. Um, there are novel chemotherapeutic approaches for higher risk patients, such as CPX351 and potentially other induction combinations. So I'm looking forward to the next decade in terms of approved therapies. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for your time. All right. You stay up for a question sure. for a moment? Thank you so much. That was an incredibly complex topic, but you delivered it with great clarity. What questions do we have for Dr. Fati? Hi, Dr. Fati. It's Sergio Huda from Moffitt Cancer Center. Thank you for a great hey, talk. Hey, how are you? Good. Um, I had a quick question about uh, how quickly does your, it's kind of a specific question, so bear with me, but why, um, like how quickly does your PCR come back for FLT3? And the reason I ask is because sometimes you make a decision on Dono 60 versus 90, whether or not you're going to do FLT3 versus gemtuzumab. Um, and so how are you guys addressing that, you know, because you have to pick the go on day one if you're going to use it or not. So just wanted to ask that question of, like, how you address that on, like, the early stage. Yeah, it's imperfect. So, um, and it depends really on the institution. What I generally do when a new patient comes in is I try and get a fish panel, and that usually you can get back in 24 to 48 powers, hours in terms of a core binding factor alteration for potential use of gemtuzumab. And we also have a rapid FLT3 test that will tell us if there is a FLT3 mutation or not. Now, there are certain FLT3 mutations that are not captured by that FLT3 test, which, again, is limiting. But for most patients, we get the information back within the first two to three days, and we can start the treatment as is recommended in terms of the, uh, the day that you would give treatment. But there are scenarios where a patient with AML may come in, and they come in with rapidly proliferative, uh, you know, disease with high white blood cell count, and you may not be able to control them with hydrea. And in those scenarios, you have to pull the trigger and start treatment and then incorporate uh, the additional therapies when you can. Um, so there are also studies looking at gemtuzumab, and not necessarily on day one, but uh, later, day three, day six. But you can uh, do it. It's not necessarily state of the art or what's been published, but um, we generally rely on more rapid testing to get our information and go from there. Dr. Edge? Hi, it's Dr. Steve Edge from Roswell Park. Um, I knew I didn't go to liquid tumors for a reason. <laughs> um, um, so this is a pathways conference. And how do, are you trying, are you, and how are you trying to incorporate this into tools that can be used by providers to make these kind of selections? Are you looking at artificial intelligence tools? Uh, 
How are you using, how can you use big data to do this? How can we incorporate this into a meaningful decision support tool other than by cloning you and having you come to all of our centers? Uh, <laughs> well, that would be nice. You know. um, so I have to be honest, Dr. Edge, I'm not a, an expert on artificial intelligence. Uh, I'd like to hire some artificial intelligence for myself personally. But I would say AML being a relatively... Um, uh, rare, relatively uncommon disease, goodness, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it can be quite challenging to sort of study it in that fashion. And the fact that these drugs are so new, it makes things a little bit more challenging. We discussed this prior to sort of putting this drug together. But we traditionally have relied on cooperative groups, looking at large databases, looking at outcomes, um, and also trying to come to some degree of consensus regarding what we recommend. I happen to sit on the NCCN panel, and there's oftentimes very lively discussion regarding what we should recommend based on the data or, or not. But it is something that um, probably requires more time and more committed work by committees such as NCCN. So a provocative question comes into my mind. In, in the surgical sphere, um, for decades, we've been talking that regionalization of pancreas cancer surgery or esophageal cancer surgery is critical to, to improving outcomes. And um, we as especially haven't done it, but the marketplace has largely done that. Um, should we have, uh, we've regionalized trauma care, um, cardiac care. Should we be regionalizing acute leukemia care so that only these patients are treated by centers like the Mass General? Um, I, parenthetically, I owe my life to the Mass General. But um, uh, only to big centers like the Mass General or, or Roswell Park or, or the other centers where there are true experts taking care of thank, what is, thank goodness, a rare disease. Should yeah. we as a society regionalize care for leukemia? In certain scenarios, yes. I mean, I think in patients who are uh, eligible for intensive induction chemotherapy, whether it's CPX351 or 7 and 3 or IA, or those types of patients do require specialized care, in my view, at large academic centers with expertise in managing toxicities of these highly um, marrow suppressive agents and combinations. With the more uh, newly emerging oral targeted agents, the toxicity profile, although important and, and important to sort of uh, disperse uh, across uh, groups, I think those patients can be managed um, in the community setting, but they require a lot of education, uh, information, and, uh, you know, um, uh, dispersing of knowledge regarding what we have seen in trials. Uh, this differentiation syndrome took us months to sort of look back at the data that we um, had collected over time to better characterize, and now we're trying to disperse that information. But generally, patients do relatively well, but you have the odd patient who will have very prominent toxicities that require close monitoring and management. So I don't see any belly stands in the microphone, so I'm going to follow up on that. Do you and the Mass General, through your community network, have a program for managing these patients where you collaborate with your community providers to provide them the support? And are you seeing this regionalization of the care within your within your your network and more globally within the within Massachusetts. We do. We try and do it in a variety of ways. We have uh, weekly meetings where we invite our community. So as you, you may know, as I were alluding to earlier prior to me getting up here, so New England is uh, literally dotted uh, with a variety of uh, community uh, practices and hospitals that are being swallowed by the larger uh, hospitals here. So you'll go somewhere, you'll see Brigham, you'll see Mass General, you'll see uh, BI. And so for our groups of uh, providers, we oftentimes invite them over to our um, sessions. We talk to them. We, we, we discuss the new and emerging therapies. I also try my best to partner with educational companies and also the industry to try and distribute the information that we have, the data that we have in terms of managing patients that are better treated or more conveniently treated in the community. Nevertheless, if a patient comes in who is induction eligible, who is potentially transplant eligible, um, we recommend management in a larger, at least I do, in a larger academic center. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Joan McClure, speaking for myself today. Oh, hi. hi how Good are to you? Good to see you. Good. Um, I, I'm wondering, listening to this conversation, whether some kind of a share care model where diagnosis is done at a big center and then some of the treatment is provided in the community makes sense because it seems like knowing what you have is key to knowing how to treat these complex, um, less prevalent diseases. Have you given any thought to that? So 
I think that's a very good paradigm. I mean, I, I, you know, for many reasons, I feel like we gather much more information and much more efficiently at academic centers than we would necessarily do in some communities. I don't want to say across the board, because some of the referrals I get, there is very comprehensive diagnostic management of the patient. So I think in certain scenarios, there is some benefit potentially to a uniform approach to the management of AML in terms of diagnosis. What I worry about the most, honestly, is that the median age of AML is 68. That means that half of our patients are in their 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And what I oftentimes worry about, sometimes when I get a referral, is a 75, 80-year-old patient, relatively robust, who is told in the community that this is AML, this is bad, I'm not sure what I have for you, let's talk about supportive measures, less aggressive measures, palliative measures, whereas I want to look at their IDH mutations, I want to see if they have a potential target, and potentially then send them back to get. So what I'm worried is I'm missing these patients who are potentially um, candidates for targeted therapy that would extend their life, give them a quality of life, decrease their transfusion needs, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's why I was suggesting the diagnostic phase be yeah. more centralized, even if the treatment phase is not. Yeah, I mean, this is something certainly we can discuss. Yeah, later. Okay. Winston. Great. Uh, Winston Wong, W squared from sunny, warm Florida. <laughs> Uh, being where, where in Florida? Uh, Sarasota. Okay. Being the payer guy and knowing what the pipeline is showing, what's the scenario out there in turn, or possibility of the scenario out there of combination therapy with a mixed FLT3, IDH1, IDH2 mutation? Well, there's, I suspect, a good amount of appetite. Um, if you probably do a quick look on clinicaltrials.gov, you'll see probably a uh, uh, a healthy number of trials that are looking at combinations of various targeted agents together. I think the trick with combining targeted therapies is monitoring for adverse events that may potentially emerge and drug interactions. And we don't know necessarily if concurrent combinations of targeted, concurrent combinations of targeted therapies is better than, put for, the, for example, sequential therapy. There's a lot of questions out there that we don't know. But are people interested in combining all these drugs together? Yes, because I go to all these meetings and everybody's talking about, can I do this, can I do that? What I worry is, um, you know, oftentimes that there's this whole sort of, you know, these Me Too, Me Too is the wrong term to use, but um, uh, trials that uh, sort of try and uh, just attach different drugs that are emerging together without much uh, rationale. I think it's much more important to look at why a certain combination or sequence may make sense in terms of uh, targeted therapies. Well, Dr. Fati, thank you so much. Even sure. if you did make us think about the CREP cycle. Yes, yes, yes. We appreciate the wonderful presentation. Thank you so much.